Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Breaking Brews Podcast, a podcast focused on the business side of beer and what's driving today's thriving craft beer industry. Whether you're one of the thousands of people making craft beer what it is today, or just love great beer and want to know more about it, this show is here to cover everything from sales, marketing, branding, culture, and much, much more. The Breaking Brews Podcast delivers real-life scenarios and experiences from industry professionals that will help your beer knowledge evolve. To tap into more great beer content, visit BreakingBrews.com today. And now, the moment you've been waiting for. Let's get this session started. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages over 21, welcome back to the Breaking Brews Podcast. I am your host, Jason Sircone, and you are tuned in to the season finale of Season 1 of The Word of the Port. In case you did not get the memo, there are 29 other sessions in the archives waiting just for you. Jump back and listen to the ones you have missed. You can subscribe to the Breaking Brews podcast on Stitcher, on iTunes, on Google Play Music, and on Spotify. You can drop a review for the show on iTunes. Let me know how I'm doing with the Breaking Brews podcast. And every review and every rating helps the podcast find the ears of more thirsty beer professionals and thirsty beer enthusiasts just like you. You can stay up to date on show notes for every episode over at breakingbrews.com slash podcast and By all means, join the Breaking Brews Podcast Central Facebook group where you can stay connected to the show as we go on a brief hiatus with Season 1 concluding today. Whew, so here we are, guys, 30 episodes deep, 30 episodes strong, and it is time for the season finale of the show. Now, I can think of no better way to wrap up a very fun, informative, productive Season 1 of the podcast than by talking in more detail about a rant that has broken out several times on this show. Now, if you're a loyal listener of the Breaking Brews podcast, several times you've heard us talk about dirty glassware and clean glassware and the lack thereof. And today, I really wanted to dive into this subject in more detail. And to help me do so, I invited Advanced Cicerone Dev Adams onto the podcast, and she put a great video on her page. Uh, It's known as Miss Lupulin, where you can go follow that page. I will have a direct link in the show notes. I'm also going to link to this video in the show notes on breakingbrews.com so you can watch this video from front to back. Dev's video talks about how to properly clean glassware, what a dirty glass looks like so you know when you see it what to expect. And today on the show, we're going to talk about why this is such an epidemic and what we can all do as beer drinkers, beer enthusiasts, beer professionals to help it go away. You're going to learn the importance of why a brand should always present their beer in clean glassware. It's a very multi-layered subject. So there's lots to uncover today as we dive into the season finale of the Breaking Brews podcast. I'm going to step aside and let you guys do just that. This is session 30 of the Breaking Brews podcast, the season one finale, all about clean, beer-ready glassware with advanced Cicerone, Dev Adams. All right, boys and girls, welcome back to the series finale of the Breaking Brews podcast. This is the end of season one, and today I have a special guest with me coming all the way from Colorado via Skype. That's right. I am joined by the one and only Dev Adams, who is an advanced Cicerone. You may know her as Miss Lupulin on Facebook. Dev, what is up? Not a whole lot. Enjoying some uh, nice mid-August weather here in Colorado. You have got the view, I have to say. (laughs) Yeah, it's not too bad out here. I'm out in my porch here in Evergreen, Colorado. We had a couple of really beautiful buck deer out here last night, so I'm keeping my eye out for them tonight. That is awesome. I got to. T- I should take a screenshot of this beautiful background that you've got here. I am buried in the studio for sound quality's sake, and you, <laughs> you've got the ultimate hookup out there in Colorado. So you're doing things <laughs> right. Well, today, boys and girls, if you've been a loyal listener of the Breaking Brews podcast, or if this is the very first episode that you've picked up, you can jump back in the archives, and what you're going to find are a handful of episodes where we broke out into a rant about 
beer clean glassware. More so, the rants broke into dirty glassware and how certain bars, breweries, restaurants, enthusiasts, you name it, are taking pictures of dirty glassware to showcase the beer that they're about to drink. This is wrong on multiple levels, as has been covered in the past. And I jumped onto the Craft Beer Professionals Facebook group and said that I could think of no better way to wrap up Season 1 of the Breaking Brews podcast than to talk about this subject in detail. And Dev was the first to emphatically respond and wholeheartedly agree that we need to talk about this more. Now, we've talked about this tongue-in-cheek, but in all seriousness, it's a real serious issue that we want to shed some light on today. So hopefully we can start putting an end to this epidemic. There's a hashtag dedicated to dirty glassware out there. Dev, refresh my memory. Is it, It's Dirty Glass Mafia, DGM, right? Yep, hashtag DGM. Anytime you see a hashtag DGM on a post, it means we've spotted a dirty glass and are trying to let you know. And we see them far too frequently to the point where yep. we, we have to spend our last episode of the season rapping about this. But here we are. we got a great show ahead of you guys today, so strap in. You're going to hear all about Dev's plight in the beer industry and also get some great tips on how to keep your glassware presentable, how to make sure that it's beer clean at your establishment and much, much more. So let's get rolling, Dev. Let's hear a little bit about you. Tell us about your background and what first got you into the beer industry and attracted to craft beer in general. Well, I'm uh, I'm from Colorado originally. I'm one of the few Colorado natives left living here in the state. Grew up surrounded by beer from, you know, Coors from a little kid to uh, when New Belgium and Odell opened up in Fort Collins. My parents would would cruise up to Fort Collins as often as they could. Um, I remember it being every week sometimes just to fill up a growler of fat tire of 90 shilling. Uh, My dad had a had a keg of of 90 shilling, one of the very first kegs sold outside of an account for Odell at his um, I believe it was his 40th birthday. So we, ha- I was surrounded by craft beer from, from a pretty young age. Um, my parents were pretty passionate about keeping it local um, and drinking really high quality. Then when I graduated college, my folks moved to Belgium for a few years for my dad's work. And so I was lucky enough to go over and spend some time with them. And during that time over there, I really fell in love with beer. I, <laughs> the flight from Colorado out to uh, Belgium is pretty, pretty extensive. It's an overnight flight. And I got off the plane. I was exhausted, just wanted to go to bed, but you can't. You got to stay up or else the jet lag will get you for the rest of the time. So my parents drove me down to the Grand Place and they put a waffle in one hand and a beer in the other. It was actually a Leffe Brune and uh, never really looked back. My dad was working in the Czech Republic, so he'd be gone about four days a week. My mom and I would go to the local store and we would grab two of every kind of beer we could find and share them and talk about them. We'd get the glassware went to the the beer museum there. We went to Delirium Tremens, the cafe, the Delirium Cafe. I uh, went to a couple of, of breweries out there, got back to Colorado, had, I didn't have a job at the time. It's on monster.com, which is, uh, I don't think exists anymore. Old school, monster.com. <laughs> and <Nice>. um, <laughs> there was a posting for a uh, tour guide at Flying Dog Brewery in Denver. Um, they're in Frederick, Maryland now. But uh, they moved out to Frederick in 2008. Prior to that, they were in Denver. And prior to that, they were in Aspen. Um, They're looking for a tour guide. And I applied. And at our very first staff meeting, the CEO of the company, Eric Warner, said, I wasn't the most qualified. I didn't have the most experience. But I was definitely the most enthusiastic. So fell in love with beer. Learned all about beer there. I learned about whiskey from Stranahan's Distillery. And it just kind of kind of snowballed from there. I, I met my partner, Josh, um, also known as the Beard Wrangler. If you follow me on social media, met him there. He was working bottling line, and he's now a professional brewer. And it was his first brew job six years ago with a brewery called Brewery Ricoli. And I offered to help them with their branding and marketing. And in exchange, they offered to help me pay to get my first two levels of the Cicerone program. So I passed my um, CBS or certified beer server back in 2013 um, in the summer. Then that October, I passed my certified Cicerone exam. And then in February of 2017, I was the second woman in the world to earn the title of advanced Cicerone. Um, And I'm also a certified BJCP judge. 
So the advanced level is actually rather, it, it's pretty new to the Cicerone certification program. Is that correct? Yeah, they added it between certified and master Cicerone. There was just such a huge gap. You're going from a half day exam, which is, you know, it's short answer, multiple choice, four essays, couple of tasting panels and a demonstration to this two day marathon. That's all panel discussions, essays, beer tastings. It was just too big of a jump. Um, it's also why the small EA program has is similarly structured with four levels as opposed to three. So they slip the uh, advanced Cicerone in there between certified and master to kind of give a bridge. Um, so the advanced Cicerone level is a full day exam eight essays, 360 multiple choice and short answer, two one-on-ones with expert in the field, three or four tasting panels, I can't remember now, but a lot of tasting. <laughs> it's separated into two separate panels, but I think there are two different um, categories on each. Um, so it's pretty extensive. It definitely tests all of your knowledge about beer. I think a lot of times people think that Cicerone's, it's all about tasting beer and it's all about our palates, and that's not true. That is a component of it. But we need to know the brewing process. We need to know brewing history. We need to know the laws around beer, which is um, pretty crazy. Draft line, maintenance, um, how to keep and serve beer. Everything you can think about with beer, we, we need to know really intimately. Yeah, if you guys jump back in the archives to session two, I talked with Master Cicerone Brian Reed, who talked about his journey through the entire program and shared a lot of knowledge on that Master Cicerone test and really – broke down in detail what he went through and it, it's it's crazy it, and I want to ask you about what your day was like taking that advanced test in a second but I want to piggyback on one of the points you just made and Brian made it as well is you really have to immerse yourself in the whole industry in order to be successful as you move through the ranks of this I I think it's very cool that a lot of restaurants and bars and breweries have been helping their servers and bartenders take that first level just to give themselves a, a nice foundation in the beer industry. And if they're going to be part of that world, it's great that they can speak very intelligently with consumers. And if they choose to go further, that's even better. It's just more people out there that can have a great conversation about beer. It's just going to keep more consumers interested in the product. But yeah, like one of Brian's big lines was you can't bullshit your way through it. And no. <laughs> now that he and, and he helps grade some of the exams now, just as being at the master level, and he says he can see it, he can, be, he can spot it a mile away if someone hasn't fully gone out there and tried and, and learned about the brewing process, learned about serving processes, learning about sales and marketing and distribution, and really giving yourself that well rounded beer knowledge. It's going to help you move through this program much more successfully. But on your end, let's hear so what was the advanced testing like for you? Well, I want to actually address something you just said, because it's really important to, for folks who are looking to join the program as well to know that it's not just your knowledge, it's your enthusiasm Indeed. and the way you approach it as well. That's why they do one-on-ones. That's why they have that personal connection. It's not just an online exam. It is proctored by people who have a higher level of certification because they want to make sure that the Cicerone program and Cicerones are approachable. They're friendly. They're enthusiastic about beer that they want really this to be the vanguard of this is what we want the craft beer industry to look like. We want excited people. We want people who are so passionate about this that they're willing to go through the absolute torture of taking these exams and the, let's call it fun, of studying as intensely as you have to study for these. So speaking of the exam, the exam for the advanced Cicerone exam, I was very unlucky in my timing for it just because I happened to have the worst head cold of my entire life Ugh. when I took it. I took it the week after GABF in uh, 2016, so the timing couldn't have been worse to begin with. Right. And I was just getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and that was the year I actually got to spend a little bit of time with Randy Mosier and John Palmer at the actual uh, GABF. And they were both day after day like, man, you're sounding worse. <laughs> I was like, yep, sure am, as I fangirled all over them. But uh, the exam itself, it's a full day. It is so intense. They take, your, they take your cell phone, you put it in a sealed bag, you keep with you. You can't open that seal the whole time. You eat lunch there. You're pretty much sequestered. The only time you can get up is to go to the use the restroom. Um, like I said, it's about 360 short answer and multiple choice. 
the one thing I'm so grateful of was a blog that warned me that the multiple choice are not your standard multiple choice where you have your question and four potential answers. This is actually, you're going to give, you're given a page of about 10 questions and at the top are 40 potential answers all grouped together. So there could be a question, you know, that's, you know, this amber beer and they won't even, and, and it won't even say ale or lager to help you <laughs> narrow it down. This amber beer has an original gravity of, you know, 1056 to 1064. And you're sitting there and you look at the, the list of possible answers and every single amber beer is up there. Wow. And you're like, well, I hate everything. <laughs> um, they say you don't have to memorize the BJCP. I found that it would have been helpful for me to have. I had a good enough grasp of it and I really knew all of the qualitative data really well. It was that quantitative data. It was those numbers, those ranges, because sometimes it's that one number that's off that will tell you exactly which beer it was. So I did use some mnemonics and stuff that helped me. Um, I was up at four o'clock in the morning, sitting in my hotel room, like hunched over the BJCP, trying to get as much information in my brain the last minute, which isn't a great studying strategy, but I knew it before then. It was just that last minute, absolute unmitigated panic. Sure. Also, you have a one-on-one. -on -one, uh, for me, it was with Ray Daniels about a beer style. And he's going to ask you, you know, what, uh, what's the beer style? Everything about it. You need to tell him. You know, it's history if you know it. Um, he's going to ask some examples, some commercial examples of that beer style. You're going to have to give him as much quantitative data as you can remember. And then he's going to give a beer and say, is this emblematic of the style? Why or why not? So that's hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's hard, especially for me, because again, mentioning the fangirl, I tend to fangirl all over these brewery folks who I just really admire and I've read their books and so it, it was tough. And then I, I, I did a beer and food pairing with Pat Fahey for the other one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. um, which was really cool because it was not just does this food work with, with this beer or what would you recommend to serve with this food? It was also would you remove or add anything to the dish to make it work better with beer? So it really made you think about how beer and food pairs together and what you can add or remove from something to make it a better a better pairing, a better meal. So that was really cool. The eight essays were intense, the tastings. So that, that was what killed me is unfortunately I missed passing the exam by one point on my tasting. Gosh, I, I was going to say, I mean, having the head cold could not have made that section. It easy. was, I, first off, I am pretty sure I had an illegal amount of, an, of decongestants <laughs> in my body at that time. <laughs> I had just everything I could do. I went through an entire box of Kleenex. I'm sure everyone hated me. It was just so miserable. But the fact that I missed by only that much, I was yeah, really happy. And ouch. that I didn't have to retake the written. That was the biggest thing. My written and one-on-ones, I was fine. I had to retake the tasting. I did that. I got to fly out to Chicago in February that next year, which was really, really fun, actually. And and I passed. I was the only one in my retake group of about 30 people who passed. Nice. So that was, um, that was a pretty proud moment for me, especially as I went out afterwards with some folks who may have disparaged me when we went to a brewery and I was kind of like, um, I don't think these are interesting so much as a lot of off flavors. Yeah. They're like, no, 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 this is just interesting. I'm like, mm. <laughs> so I felt a little good later. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Big difference between interesting and diacetyl. Yep. <laughs> well, so what are, what are you doing in the beer industry now? So right now what I do is I, I consult with different breweries and I'm a pretty one-stop shop for consulting. Mm -hmm. I do everything from um, staff training, from basic customer service up to, you know, beer styles, sensory, all of that. I also do branding and marketing work okay. for folks, get them positioned well on social media. Um, I've even done a little bit of location scouting for folks, kind of letting them know where there might be some gaps in, um, in the brewery presence, wherever they're looking. I am very passionate about the sensory side of things. I believe that every brewery not only should, but can have a sensory program, a formal sensory program to evaluate their beers. So that's my big thing is pushing breweries to really build those sensory programs. So sitting down with them, showing them how it's really, while there's a time commitment up front and there's, there's a monetary commitment up front, it's actually pretty minimal in the ongoing monetary and time commitments are really, really minimal considering your ROI on that. So we have here in Colorado, we have a great company called Firmly 
and they do uh, mobile testing. So they collect people's beer and they do all of the testing for different off flavors, alcohol content, IBUs, all of that. So they do all of that, again, that quantitative, I'm more about the qualitative, I'm more about that sensory and that, that more subjective look at your beers. Because if you're not willing to be honest with yourself about the quality of your beer or about what you're really looking for, for those flavors and aromas in your beer, you're never going to make great beer. Um, so I do that. I also do some writing. I do have a blog. I've written a little bit for also Colorado Brewery List, which is a great website. That's a comprehensive list of every brewery in Colorado, 407 as of today, by the way. Wow. Um, and then I make uh, beer-related jewelry out of <laughs> out of beer cans. I make they're called beer rings. I'm wearing a pair right now, and you know, so I'm all over the place. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll uh, I'll make sure. I'm I'm assuming that your Facebook page, Miss Lupulin, will connect people to all of this. Yes. In, in some capacity. So I'll make sure that I have a link for that for all of our listeners to click on. So knowing what you know and, and, and as far as you've come with the advanced train or the advanced Cicerone training and, and certification, are you making the jump to take the master level Cicerone certification? I plan to. The human brain is pretty amazing at forgetting pain. Otherwise we would only ever have like one child. Um, so <laughs> I'm waiting for, for my brain to forget the swelling's got to go down a little bit yeah (laughs) (laughs) so i'm studying a little bit i'm not hardcore studying yet i have a full-time job working for the state of colorado and things have been in upheaval at my job so i'm trying to let that settle a little bit before i can really focus entirely on studying and and get to it so hopefully in the next couple of years i'll be ready well best wishes and good luck when you decide to tackle that and again, <laughs> like you. say, knowing talking with Brian and his journey through it, it was not easy. And you guys absolutely earn your stripes, and you earn what you get. It's a lot of hard work, a big time commitment. So, to you and to anyone out there listening that is taking that leap, best wishes and good luck, and let us know how it goes. Heck yeah, breathe deep, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and try not to get a head cold going into the exam day. Oh my day. <laughs> goodness! Seriously, take all the zinc in the world beforehand. Vitamin C out the ass. <laughs> so again, as I said at the top of the show, we're gonna talk a lot about dirty glassware, that epidemic, the the whole topic of beer clean glassware, what that means, why it's important. But before we jump into that, Dev, let me ask you. What is a big trend that you're seeing in the beer industry today outside of that that really surprises you, really makes you just scratch your head? It actually kind of piggybacks on dirty glassware, and that's the amount of bad, uneducated service I've seen in the industry. And when I say bad, I mean rude servers, servers who know nothing about beer at all, servers who who couldn't care less about being in customer service, who roll their eyes at customers, who Again, just the rudeness drives me insane. It's kind of an epidemic, especially down in Denver here. Just we have so many breweries. And I think at some point there are certain breweries who are maybe opening who don't understand the value of getting people who are really passionate about beer in there. And they're looking for just people with either like bartending experience or their buddies. And it's just it's not going great. Um, Service, you know, you really need to let people know what the culture of your business is and and really empower them to embrace that culture and to live that culture, to spread it to your customers. The uneducated part, at this point, with the internet especially, there's no excuse. And not here in Colorado. There's no excuse if you own a brewery to have servers who are uneducated about beer. And I'm not saying that they have to know everything. They don't need to be certified or advanced or master Cicerones. There's no excuse for having uneducated servers, not not with the internet around, not with, especially here in Colorado, where you can have people go and visit other breweries and really taste their beers and learn from them. I mean, I run sensory programs on a regular basis, off-flavor courses, as well as just basic sensory. Um, You can get someone to come in and run that in the business getting people to have their CBS, their certified beer server, just like you were talking about earlier, it gives a baseline. It gives someone, hey, I know at least the basics about beer. I can tell you the difference between an IPA and an amber. You know, I also put that a little bit on the brewers. They need to be communicating their beers to the servers. They need to be providing, you know, here are the hops, 
here's the malt, you know, those basics, because there are people like me who are going to want to know, mm-hmm. especially when I walk in and, and I see a place that has seven different IPAs. I kind of want to know what hops are in them because there are certain hops I'm not a huge fan of. And there are other hops I really gravitate towards. And so instead of doing seven little tastes of beer, which is really annoying, I would rather just, oh, this beer has Apollo in it. Probably not my shtick. That one's mosaic. Done. Sold. Mm -hmm. Give that one to me. So it's really important to have that communication between the brewers and the servers. But it's also just making sure that your servers can communicate that in a friendly and intelligent way. My favorite thing in the world is when I have a server who doesn't know something and they go, you know what? I'm so sorry. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out for you Mm -hmm. because there's no shame in that whatsoever. It's just admitting that you don't know something. (laughs) Right. It blows my mind that from a, and you're talking to a guy that's never officially been a server, but to me, the, the connection seems very easy to figure out that if, you can engage a customer and keep them in the seat and really make them feel welcome and and help them understand the product a little bit more. They're going to buy more of that product, which makes their bill go higher, which exponentially makes your tip go higher, which is why you're there. Absolutely. That seems very simple to me, but like you said, Deb, there's so many places that you go where the service is just atrocious, and it's terribly unfortunate just because, A, I mean, they're representing their company, and that's the face that's getting put on the company in the customer's eyes if that's what they see. And and B, again, why would they not want to earn extra money while they're there? And they could do that by just having some just having some personality. And I honestly, I mean, I actually just experienced this this past weekend. We were at Southern Tier, the brew pub in Pittsburgh, the official breweries in Lakewood, New York, but they have a great brew pub here in Pittsburgh. My girlfriend and I were having lunch, and our server was fantastic. He was personable. He was engaged. He stopped by many times to make sure we were okay. He made conversation with us. And he ended up getting a great tip at the end because he did a phenomenal job. And people like that should be awarded for their hard work. But I think ownership and management really has to be aware when they have a server that is putting a bad spin on their business because they're just not taking the time to engage with their customers. It's, it's not a good thing. So yeah, you're, you're right. That is a bad epidemic we're facing these days. It, it's rough. And um, so Josh and I have been to 812 breweries together, most of them in the U S a couple down in Mexico. Wow. And uh, so we have a little experience visiting breweries. Yeah, I'll say. And- <laughs> That's huge. I would rather go back to a brewery with good beer and amazing service a hundred times before I'm going to go back to a brewery with great beer and bad service. Indeed. I mean, I can go to the liquor store, pick up any great beer that's brewed from across the country and across the world at mm-hmm. this point, come home, sit in my underwear, watch stranger things with my dogs. <laughs> you know, that's the most comfortable environment. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper, but I go to breweries almost every single day. Because I want the atmosphere, I want the experience, I want the service. It's so important to me. You know, I think of all of my favorite breweries that I visited. It was all about the atmosphere and the service. And yeah, the beer was also good. But really, when I think about the brewery itself and that experience, it's all about the experience. Indeed. I know that's been something we've talked about many times here on the show. And I really feel that When I look back on 30 episodes, including our talk today, Dev, I I really feel like that's one of the most important points that's been touched upon because it came up so often with so many different guests that if you're not trying to build an experience for your consumer, you're not going to see them again because they Mm -hmm. have so many options these days for their entertainment dollar. And more times than not, even if you have a great product, they're going to go someplace where they can say, damn, this was a fantastic time. I can't wait to come back here again. Even if the beer is not at the same level, they still want that experience to go with it. So you have to be thinking on multiple levels. It can't just be about the beer. It has to be about the whole experience that you're creating. And if you have a tap room and you're asking yourself why things aren't going well, look around and see how many regulars you have. See how much repeat business you have. If you, have a, if you have a bunch of regulars and repeat business, you're probably doing okay mm-hmm. because those are the people who aren't just bringing themselves back in and spending money time after time after time after time. They're bringing their friends. They're bringing their family. They want to show people their favorite place. I know we do it. Whenever mm-hmm. my parents come back into town, the poor people are dragged all over the Colorado Front Range to visit breweries. And now they're beer people, like I mentioned. They live in Asheville, North Carolina. 
for a reason. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's still, we want to bring people and have those great experiences. You know, I have, I have a very dear friend named Emma, who I met when she messaged me years ago through Facebook, um, through Miss Lupulin, saying, hey, I'm coming out to Colorado. Where should I, where should I visit brewery-wise? Her and her husband were coming from Australia. So I made some recommendations and I said, hey, why don't, why don't we meet you at Locavore in Littleton, one of our, our favorite breweries? You know, we'll eat, meet early in the morning. So if things are weird, we, you know, we can just break loose and it's going to be fine. We spent all that day together, all the next day together. The next time they came out, we spent the whole week together. They've been out twice since. Really, really dear friends, but I'm always so excited to bring them to breweries where the service is great because they have a different standard of service at their breweries in Australia. They have a different standard of beer. So not only do I want to introduce them to places that have amazing beer, I want them to experience the service. I want them to have that one-on-one. I want them to sit at the bar, introduce them to my friends behind the bar, say, look at how cool this place is. Here's why I always talk about it. I, I, I think that the places that are offering that dynamic are really good, the ones that are ahead of the game right now. And, and, and you can mm-hmm. see it in, success, in the success they have. They're constantly packed. They constantly have people coming back time and time again. So I think that's a perfect segue into the subject at hand today and ultimately what can help lend to that great experience. And that is presenting your beer to the consumer in a beer clean, beer ready glass. So again, to uh, set the table for what Dev and I are about to dive into, this has come up many times here on the show. If you've never listened to an episode of the Breaking Brews podcast, you can jump back in the archives, and I'm sure at some point you're going to stumble on an episode where this subject came up. But we see this a lot. If you look at Instagram, you look at Facebook, you look at Twitter, you look at Untapped, there are a lot of outlets where brands and a lot of outlets where consumers can post images of beer. And far too often, we see pictures where the glassware is just not presentable. It's got the bubbles. It's got smudges. I, I've seen beer presented. Actually, I actually just experienced this at a location where uh, my girlfriend had to give a glass back that had a, a lipstick on it. Yeah. Beer hadn't been poured yet, and she caught it. And she said, uh, can I not use this glass? And they said, oh, God, yeah. So, And they were totally cool. They weren't. You know, obviously someone that had set that on the table had missed it, but it happens a lot. And it's something that we're hoping to try to tame down as we move forward, because it's just from a branding standpoint, it does not speak well to your brand if you're posting pictures where the glassware is dirty. From a consumer standpoint, it's not good if you're taking pictures for that brand, because you are backhandedly representing that brand you're supporting them by drinking their beer if you're gonna take pictures of the beer you want to make sure the glass looks good so we want to get into some basics about this today but ultimately we want to try to provide some tips for you guys so we can try to tame this down as i said so dev let me put this out to you because i know that you are very emphatic and very passionate about this subject as well why is this so damn important? Why is clean glassware so important? Well, I think the most obvious thing is you wouldn't eat off of a dirty plate. You wouldn't use a dirty fork. Why in the world would you drink out of a dirty glass? So that's first and foremost. We'll get that out of the way because dirty glasses are so gross. (laughs) So gross. But if we want to kind of get into like beer clean and the difference between what may look clean and beer clean, we really want to present our beer the way the brewer meant for it to be presented. There is so much time and money and effort that goes into brewing great craft beer or beer of any kind to be that, to be honest, you know, even when you're talking about the big boys, the consistency behind their product is, is phenomenal. The Mm -hmm. amount of money that goes behind that phenomenal. But when you're talking at your local small craft brewery, I mean, you're talking one gal or guy back there, you know, they're hauling that grain up, they're milling it, they're formulating the recipes, they're mashing in, you know, they have to grain out, they have to babysit that yeast as it makes the beer, you know, they have to make sure that it's perfect. Why in the world would you not want that product has had that much time and effort gone into it and that you're paying a pretty good amount for if it's craft beer, why would you not want it to be presented in exactly the way that the brewer intended? whether that be have the correct, you know, head retention, the correct mouthfeel, correct flavors and aromas, 
or just look beautiful in a glass. I don't really, know. really important. Yeah, I, I don't know <laughs> why exactly. Why wouldn't you want any of that? But we, again, that that and that's why we're talking about this today, and why we've talked about it so much is that I don't know if that level of thought and level of care really goes into it from start to finish. And I, I can speak to a couple breweries that I've spoken to directly that have said that this is. I mean, they they're taking it to this level even as far as distribution goes. They won't distribute their beer unless they know the establishment that's getting it takes care of their lines, takes care of their glassware, serves the beer in not just beer clean glassware, but the proper glassware for the style, Yeah, which says a lot. I think that's really, it, it's taking distribution to a, to the next level, but I think it's credible and it, it says a lot for how much they care about their brand to, to go to that extreme. Absolutely. I think it's so important for brands to be taking care of their customers at off-premise locations mm -hmm. as much as they do in their own tap room, especially as we see some brands shift to being only distribution. We have a couple here in Colorado that have made that pivot in the last six months. And just for those breweries that are trying to get out in the market more and more, trying to get that brand recognition by being at other locations to make sure that that care is, is carried through, that culture of their beer is carried through is crucial. We have uh, one brewery here in Colorado called Beerstadt Lager House that's pretty famous for only allowing their beer to be poured in their glassware. They have mm -hmm. these beautiful little, little footed Pilsner glasses and they have a slow pour Pils it has this nice little uh, wooden rack that the glasses sit upside down on and they sign contracts with their off-premise folks. So whether that's hops and pie, which is a great place down in Denver or um, barrels and bottles out in golden, another, another great brewery and tap house, they sign these contracts with them and say, we will only pour in your glasses. You know, this is how the beer is poured. This is how it should look it's really important to them that their brand stays faithful and they're only making, I think four regular beers plus a couple of seasonals. So they really have a very limited lineup to begin with. And so it's important that when people see their glasses, they immediately go, Oh, that's beer shot. The strip district is one of the most historic areas in the great city of Pittsburgh and no visit to this always hopping area of town is complete without a stop at the beer hive. Located in the heart of the Strip on Penn Avenue, the Beer Hive features a constantly rotating craft beer draft, bottle, and can selection for you to enjoy each and every day. Plus daily happy hours, special events, and much, much more. The Hive has also recently rolled out a new food menu too, so make sure you come hungry and enjoy all the good eats they have in store for you. Plus grab your home stock of pickles courtesy of Pittsburgh Pickle Company, as well as a jug of Briny Mary, a Bloody Mary mix infused with Pittsburgh Pickle Company brine. Perfect for those morning cocktails when you don't want to leave the house. To learn more, visit www.thebeerhive.com today and check them out on Instagram at thebeerhivepgh. Knowing that we see so many brands going to that extent, why do you feel this is so overlooked in the industry? Because on a wide scale it really is i think there are a couple things i think that owners i think that owners and managers are sometimes are, are too often i should say uneducated on why this is important they think okay you know i have my my three vessel sink you know i've i've added the correct chemicals it's clean mm -hmm. they're not thinking about oh i actually have to clean the bottom of the glass oh i should be wiping the edge before i clean it to make sure there isn't any chapstick or lipstick along the edge. Oh, I really need to make sure that the brushes are clean that I'm using. I need to make sure that if I'm using a dishwasher, I'm not mixing anything that had fats in it, like milk or, you know, food with the glassware. They're not thinking it all the way through. It's just an education thing. Mm -hmm. There are some breweries that just don't care. There are some tap houses that just don't care. It's never mattered to them and they don't think it matters to their customers. And the brands that they're representing, especially at, at tap houses, aren't holding them accountable. And that's really what it comes down to in those cases is the brewery saying, I'm sorry, your glassware is filthy. I'm not going to serve my beer here. Obviously, we've seen a lot online from the pictures that have been posted. But what is the grossest dirty glass that you've ever encountered in person? <laughs> I was down on a work trip um, in Dallas, Texas. 
actually had a great time at the, on the trip, went to a great little brewery. If anyone's ever uh, down in uh, the grapevine area called Hop and Sting, that was just really wonderful. But we went to another bar in downtown Dallas that I won't name that they had these big chalice type glasses, the kind that you see uh, margaritas poured in. And, and there's a lot of the, what are they called? The fresh fruit juices down in Mexico. They pour them in the same glasses. Well, our beers come out and the, the, the inside of the glass is completely covered in bubbles. The, the beer that I ordered should have been clear. It was definitely not a hazy beer, yet the glass was so dirty and almost looked hazy. It was like greasy feeling, the glass itself. And this is a huge, huge bar, tap room. They have a decent beer selection. You would think that they know how to clean a glass. Everyone's at the table was like this. It wasn't just mine. And I'm trying to sit there trying to just be like, okay, you don't need, just don't say anything. Just don't say anything. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Well, round two comes out and there's actually like nacho cheese or queso stuck on the inside of one of the glasses. Oh, God. I'm like, I couldn't, I just couldn't. It was, it was too much for me. So I, I had to just let my head explode to, to my, to my coworkers and just be like, guys, this is filthy and let me explain why. <laughs> and just, I mean, just, Glass being greasy. That's so gross. I mean, yeah, it was it was nasty. And and unfortunately we found that at more places that we went in Dallas than than not was that the glassware was really, really dirty. And and I see I've seen it defended in Facebook conversations and, and, and Instagram comments, and it just makes me want to lose my freaking mind. Like it's so I don't understand, like I don't understand defending it. No. I just it, it, it's mind boggling to me. I don't, how do you defend it? Like, how is this? Oh yeah. You know, it's not a big deal. Like it's just disgusting, but you know, I'm trash. So. <laughs> well, you touched on it perfectly at the beginning when you were saying that you would not eat off a dirty plate that would never be acceptable. Why is drinking beer from a dirty glass? Eh, no big deal. I'm never going to be able to figure that dynamic out. I will, I will never understand it. But this is also, there, there's some education here too because there are people who are still used to drinking the big mass market American lagers, which have no head. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they don't understand that, that the head of a beer is really important. It's important to the aroma. It's important to the flavor. It's important to the mouthfeel. So when you have a beer that's poured with no head, it looks right to them because they're so used to these mass market lagers. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing for those lagers or inappropriate for those lagers, saying for beers that are brewed with higher protein ingredients, they tend to be craft beers, they tend to be a little bit higher quality ingredients, they're going to at least have some head. Obviously, there's alcohol content that affects that. There are a lot of things, but let's just talk like a Hefeweizen. So even just like a nice light wheat beer, it should have this huge, beautiful, fluffy head if it's served correctly. And if it's served incorrectly, if it's served in a dirty glass, you're not going to get that head at all. It's not going to have that beautiful lacing down the side. And it's not going to have the right mouthfeel and the right flavor for the style. Some people think that's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, no. no. <laughs> Did your soul die just there for a second? Uh, well. <laughs> the whole piece of it. <laughs> Every time I see a picture with, the, the nucleation points or the bubbles oh. that you see that that's typically when I feel like a small piece of me inside. And I will say that, that ironically, this whole rant about dirty glassware on this podcast has led to a lot of my friends sending me pictures whenever they find them. They're like, Oh, look at this one. It's You're almost like, like, please stop. It's almost like, like I, someone should develop an app that you can. <laughs> anyway, the DM app. <laughs> I don't want to no, Maybe I should keep that one to myself and do that later, but. Let's uh, let's talk about the fact that you, you mentioned the head being a very important part to a lot of craft beers. I think that's a great segue into the question of why should brands be so cognizant of using beer ready glassware and beer clean glassware at all time? Obviously, the head delivering that aroma is an important part. What else is involved? Well, you've got that mouth feel. You know, if you're if your glass isn't clean, there could be oils in there, and that's that's most often the cause is oils of not the nucleation points, but of that head retention dropping, you're not going to get the correct mouthfeel. It could be a little bit greasy. You could get off flavors from those oils. And I'm not just talking oils like cooking oil, something like that. It could be oil from skin. It could be oil from, you know, milk. 
people at home stop using your beer glasses for beer floats use <laughs> shaker pints leave your nice beer glasses out of the equation filthy um those oils are really really detrimental to, just to everything um you could have sanitizer in there that's uh nucleation points are are most often most often when i see nucleation points unless it's just pure filth like that place i was talking about it's going to be sanitizer that wasn't properly rinsed out or fuzz from washing it out with a rag so that's another thing don't wipe it down with a rag to dry it off if you want to wipe the lip or whatever before you wash it wipe the bottoms off that's great because you're going to wash it afterwards but really the glasses should be able to dry on a wire rack where there's good circulation around them don't wipe them down they're not wine glasses i think that's a holdover from the wine industry which works well for them but that's because they're not pouring a highly carbonated uh, item so they don't need to worry quite so much about it the aroma can be affected if you got sanitizer in there if you have if you have oils in there any of that can really affect all of these different components of the enjoyment of the beer. You know, there are other things that you need to think about too. Like you were saying earlier, really, you know, you have at your brewery, you say you have your marketing team. Maybe it's your, your head beer tender who posts everything on Instagram. Maybe, you know, it's the owner, but it's also every single person who walks into your establishment and takes a photo of your beer. They're your marketing team. Do you want them posting some, dirty glass or do you want them posting something beautiful something beautiful with a lovely head or nice lacing down the glass you can see through or, or in the case of like hazies you know you get that nice iridescence out of them what would you rather see in a picture would you rather see something that looks almost professional even from you know some rando like me walking in and snapping a picture or do you want something that people are going to ha hashtag dgm on yeah. you know there's word of mouth there's you know this place has really cool glassware and like the beers tasted really good and they smelled really good and they were so pretty when they came out or the, eh, the beer's okay. I think I've given that advice for a while to, to anybody that I'm talking to about this subject is every beer you pour, you need to consider, or you need to be thinking on the level of that beer is going to end up on the internet in some way, shape or form. Yep. Cons always. Cons it's, you always have to consider yeah. that. Consumers are going to take pictures for their untapped check-ins for the for for everything for it, 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 whether it's a beer selfie, whatever the case may be. You want your beer to always be be pushed across the bar, knowing that hey, that's going to end up online, and that's a great representation of what we do here. And if and it's dirty, that that's then that's a it. horrible representation of what we do here. <laughs> and that's a that's a great point of why this has actually become more important is because of the pro proliferation of untapped and Instagram and Facebook and all that, where people can share what they're doing at all times of the day and night, photos, experiences, reviews, beer clean glassware has always been important, but now everybody can share their experience. So you really want it to be the best possible experience they can have. Indeed. So what is the Cicerone certification program done to bring awareness to this subject and ultimately help more locations use beer ready beer clean glassware. One of the things is when you're studying, no matter which level of Cicerone you're studying for all four levels, the draft quality manual DQM is central to the studying. And that has all of the steps of how to, how to properly wash a glass, how to test to make sure it's beer clean, all of those different steps. So that's central to the studying for that, program um, again whatever level you're going for what they did that was really cool this spring was april 27th they had beer clean glass day so that was actually a day to promote beer clean glassware to say this is what it looks like when your glass is beer clean and they put out a really cool infographic about it that shows half is a clean glass and half is a dirty glass mm -hmm. really they're trying to educate people on what it looks like and why it's important I did a video for Beer Clean Glass Day. It's it's a slog. It's a little bit longer than I was expecting. I got to record it at a local brewery, Barrels and Bottles, which I mentioned earlier as well. Had a great time there recording it. Got to show a really filthy glass I had sitting on my counter for a while that had a lot of dust in it. It was funny because you actually looked at the glass and you couldn't tell that it was dirty. And then when I poured beer in it, it was just nucleation all the way up the sides. I actually have a, a new curio, which I'm super excited about. It's really, really nice to keep my glasses in so I don't have to worry about the dust so much. Um, although I still rinse my glass with cold water before I fill it with a beer, yeah. just like you would 
at really good breweries. So, you know, Cicerone program takes this very seriously. Declaring April 27th Beer Clean Glass Day, I think, proves that. They're constantly posting things on their page about beer clean glassware. And those of us who are Cicerones are constantly talking about it as well. You know, we're beer evangelists, so <laughs> we might as well talk about drinking beer out of clean glasses. There needs to be more of us doing it. Seriously. Yes, there, absolutely. There, there, that's the only way this is going to stop being the epidemic that it is, is that more of us are going to keep spreading that education and spreading the good word of why this is so important. And, you know, it can be uncomfortable to say, I mean, like you were talking about to sit, to say at a, sit at a bar, sit at a brewery and say, Hey, you know, this glass is dirty, but as long as you're humble, as long as you're polite, it's not a big deal. I was, I was sitting at, at a brewery that I absolutely love and they gave me a beer and a dirty glass. And I was like, Hey, I'm super sorry. But, and, and I honestly don't think he saw it because when he sat it, set it down, it was behind his hand. Yeah. He sat down and there was this big nucleation point on the side. I was like, I'm really sorry, but the glass is actually dirty. And he's like, Oh my gosh. So embarrassed that it happened. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, Oh no, it's not a big deal. It happens. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, got me a new glass. Um, I gave a hard time to my little local uh, tap house down here because their glass rinser is broken <laughs> <laughs> and it's been broken for some time. And I'm just like, come on guys. But oh, their glass was always super clean. I just like to give them a hard time about not rinsing. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell for everybody listening out there, the video that Dev mentioned before, it's about a 12 minute video and it's, it's fantastic. And because we're in an audio format, it's probably not good radio for us to go through the step-by-step -step process of cleaning a beer glass to the point where it is beer clean. So what I'll do, <laughs> it, I, and I, like I said, I'm going to have a link to Dev's page, Miss Lupulin, on Facebook so you can go like her page. I'm going to embed this video on the show notes on Breaking Brews, so that'll be at breakingbrews.com slash podsession30. So you'll be able to see this video, and it really does a fantastic job. Dev goes from start to finish, like like she said, showing a very, very dirty glass. And when you see this glass, I want you to burn into your mind that there are some locations that put beer in that and want you to drink it. And I'm not even joking when I say that. Dev's got this <laughs> look on her face like, yeah, but it's the truth. But it's so gross. <laughs> There's so much dust floating on the top of that, of yeah. that glass. <laughs> but she shows you the steps of how it should be cleaned, what kind of sanitizer should be should be utilized, how this glass should be dried, and ultimately what a beer looks like when you pour it into a beer clean glass. So jump, definitely jump over to the show notes to check that out. For all of our enthusiasts at home that are looking to make sure that their glassware is clean and, 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 and beer ready for their at-home pictures and for their at-home consumption, what sort of dish detergent can they pick up? Should they look for something at the grocery store? Should they be going to a specialty store? What would you recommend for someone that wants to make sure that their stuff's ready to go at home? I think my biggest recommendation is rinse, rinse, rinse. Rinse that glass so many times. Don't put it in a dishwasher unless you have a dedicated dishwasher just for your beer glasses. And, and don't look at me like that. There are people crazy enough to do that, I promise. One day when I have a dishwasher, that will be me. Um, my dishwasher is very beardy and tall and drinks a lot of beer. Um, so just rinsing the glassware is so important. When you wash your glasses, whatever detergent that you use, um, and I, I highly recommend that you try to find detergent that is low sudsing if you can, because what they're using to create those suds and to break down that grease actually affects your head retention as well. But if you're really good about rinsing it, you can really mitigate some of those effects, especially let's say you wash your glass normally and you rinse it a couple of times after you've washed it, you let it dry. And then right before you use it, you rinse it again. You're doing a pretty good job. No matter what, if you're not using a product, there's a product that you can get on Amazon called beer clean. If you're not using one of those specialty products, you're going to have some head retention issues, but you're not going to have filthy nucleation points. You're going to have it really clean. You're going to get a really nice pour there are a lot of people who choose not to wash their glasses with soap at all. And what they're doing is they're just rinsing it with very, very hot water and sanitizing it even. Again, whether that be in a dedicated dishwasher or just using super, super hot water, that's one way you can go. That's really up to you. I'm not going to say that that's maybe the best 
food industry standard <laughs> um, if you're hand washing, but that is one way you can do it. Definitely make sure you're wiping around the rim of the glass. I'm very cognizant of not wearing any chapstick or anything with oils on my lips when I drink, because not only is it going to stay on the lip of my glass and I feel so bad for bar staff who has to clean that off. I feel bad for myself for having when I have to clean that off, but it also again is going to affect your uh, view of the beer. It's going to affect that head retention. It's going to affect the mouthfeel. It's going to affect the flavor. So wipe off that chapstick and that's going to help a lot. So just do what we do at a brewery, but do it on the home level. Wipe the edge of the glass, get any of that off, you know, rinse the glass well, wash it really well. Um, whether you use detergent, whether you use something like a diluted PBW, which is a, a cleaning chemical that you can get for brewing. It's a little on the pricey side though, whether you're using beer clean, whatever you're using, make sure you clean it well and then just rinse, rinse, rinse. Yeah. I mean, that that's the, the very detailed version. I think even after you go through that process, I, what I typically do anytime I'm, I mean, even whenever I'm pouring a beer, I always give the inside a rinse, but when I know I'm going to be taking a photo of that beer, I absolutely make sure that I'm rinse, doing, giving it a quick rinse. Because you think about when you're visiting a tap room or some bars, they are always giving the glass that rinse before they pour your beer. Mm -hmm. So it's good practice to do that at home as well. Yeah, absolutely. Rinsing is so good. It also cools your glass down. So mm -hmm. you're going to have a better reaction between your beer and the glass. One thing I do want to kind of touch on when we talk about dirty glasses, some of the grossest glasses you're going to see are those that are frozen. <laughs> freezing glasses is gross first off you're trapping sanitizer on the glass no matter what if you're freezing it you're trapping sanitizer on the glass it doesn't have the opportunity to evaporate so it's getting trapped there you're getting tons of little molecules because you're tr you're setting those glasses right side up so stuff is falling into those glasses unfortunately this happens at occasionally a brewery most of the time it's going to be a bar or a restaurant where they bring out a frozen glass, you just see those nucleation points. You're also diluting your beer. You're killing the head retention. Refrigerated glasses can be okay. I have seen a lot of the same problems I see with frozen glasses. Maybe not as extensive, maybe not as much sanitizer in them, but you're still having those nucleation points. They still tend to not be as clean, and they're definitely not getting rinsed with cold water right before you put your beer in it. I actually had this experience about a month ago where a, I was brought a bottle of beer and then they brought me a frozen glass and I just immediately okay. said, no, thank you. Can I please just have a regular glass? And she looked at me sort of funny as if that wasn't something she heard very often. And <laughs> then she says, yeah, sure. So she went and got me a regular glass. I said, thank you very much and drank my beer the way it was meant to be drank. <laughs> I I remember I, my a good buddy of mine posted a picture of a warlock from Southern Tier, and he was all excited to, to have it, and he had it in a frosted mug. Mm -mm. It's like you dumb bastard. Mm -mm. That's that's a hard no. Plus, yes. you don't necessarily want well, you you almost never want a craft beer that cold. Right. Really, craft beer is is better. You want those aromas to come out. You want those flavors to break out of it. And depending on style. You may want it as warm as 55 degrees if you're talking those really lovely heavy imperial stouts, mm -hmm. barley wines. You know, you want all those flavors and aromas to come out. Yeah, you want it as cold as humanly possible when you're drinking a mass market lager. Yeah. But, you know, even when you're talking craft lagers, even American light lagers that are craft, you want them just a little bit warmer because you really want those flavors and aromas. You're absolutely right. So, again, we I had mentioned that I've seen this subject defended and, and, and people have said it's no big deal. So we may have already covered this and, and talked about this as we've gone through this episode, but what do you say to the person that says non beer clean glassware is no big deal? You're missing out friend. <laughs> you're missing out on all the lovely nuances. You're missing out on all the hard work a brewer put into this. You know, you're missing out on what the brewer intended you to drink. And it is a big deal because, again, who wants to be drinking out of a dirty glass? It's just gross. Right. You're not going to just eat off of a table without without a plate because the table's probably pretty gross. Same way if you're drinking out of a dirty glass. No doubt about it. Well, Dev, I want to thank you for taking the time to wrap about this subject with me. I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels this passionately <laughs> about the dirty glass or epidemic. 
again, hopefully all of us as beer consumers and beer enthusiasts and beer professionals can take some strides to make this go away. And again, I, 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 I talk to the marketers out there. I know a lot of them that I have spoken to one-on-one -on -one have said the same thing. They see these pictures and it's cringeworthy to just not be cognizant of what that's doing to put an image of your brand out there that's making a lot of people scratch their head. Well, and even when you look back historically and you look at when clear glassware became available to the masses, it was at the same time that Pilsners became popular because before then we're drinking out of pewter, we're drinking out of, you know, earthenware mugs. The beer, the way the beer looked didn't matter. It was right. turbid, it was ugly, it was just murky. And then this beautiful Pilsner comes out that's this beautiful lager, has all these beautiful bubbles, it's clear, it's wonderful to look at. So really the first time that we have a beer we want to look at, we're seeing it in clear glasses and it was all about marketing. It was all about branding. You see these beautiful branded glasses from all the way back in the 1700s when Pilsners first started coming out because people were saying, you know what? I want someone to know that they are drinking this beer. They are drinking my beer. Look at how beautiful my beer is in, the, in this glass. should be the same now. We got to learn from history. That marketing worked then. That's why Pilsner became the most popular beer in the world. Mm -hmm. It works today. And we're just a little bit more photogenic now than we were centuries ago. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No what... more, uh, no more. What is that? The the daguerre, daguerre graph or whatever the old photos were. Yeah. yeah, little pinhole cameras. I know there's an Instagram filter that will harken back to those days to some degree but <laughs> let's just make sure we're doing our part to put the prettiest beers on the internet for those yeah. to consume with our eyes hold on to history while we progress forward <laughs> there you go that's the that, that, if you're going to take one thing away from this podcast there it is <laughs> <laughs> take one thing away don't wear chapstick while you drink beer <laughs> <laughs> Now, this has been a lot of fun thanks for taking some time and like i said to all of our listeners out there we're looking to uh, knock the dirty glassware game and epidemic down one podcast at a time that we've done our part today. What a way to wrap up season one, huh? Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, Jason. thanks, Dev. Cheers. Cheers. And there you have it, boys and girls. That is session 30 of the Breaking Brews podcast. A big thank you to Dev Adams for coming on the podcast and rapping with me about clean glassware. Clearly from this discussion, you can tell how passionately she feels about this. She's doing a ton to put an end to the dirty glassware epidemic. I applaud Dev's efforts, and I appreciate her taking the time to come on the podcast today and talk about it with each and every one of you. I will put a link to her Facebook page, Miss Lupulin, so you can follow all of Dev's beer plights. And I'm going to embed the video on BreakingBrews.com in the show notes for this episode. It will be BreakingBrews.com slash pod session 30. You can also find a link to that and every episode's show notes at BreakingBrews.com slash podcast. The archives are there and waiting for you. And you've got time to catch up because, as I mentioned before, this was it. Season one is officially in the history books. As we wrap up season one of the Breaking Brews podcast, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to everyone out there who has listened to an episode, who has shared an episode, who has come on as a guest on the Breaking Brews podcast and helped me put this resource together. I can't thank all of you enough. I started this podcast as a means of providing a useful resource for the craft beer community. Whether you work in the industry, whether you're a craft beer enthusiast who just wants to learn more about beer and about the industry itself, the idea here was to create something that could be utilized by anyone that listens to it who is a fan of beer, who works in beer, no matter where they're located in the country. And I feel that we've been able to accomplish just that, but I wouldn't have the drive and I wouldn't have the motivation to keep doing this podcast if it wasn't for the text messages or the Instagram messages or the tweets, no matter what means of communication you've used to reach out and tell me what you've thought of the breaking Bruce podcast. I can't thank you enough. 
whether the feedback was good or whether the feedback was bad, it's helped me develop this show into what it's become. And I feel like it's going to continue to just get better and better as we roll into season two and beyond. So if you've taken even a minute to let me know how I'm doing with the show, to drop a review, to drop a rating, to share an episode on your social media network of choice. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for making season one an absolute success. And I can't wait to get back behind this microphone and bring you guys the season premiere of season two. Stay tuned. It'll be here sooner than you think. Until then, jump over to the Breaking Brews Podcast Central Facebook group where you can stay connected to the show. We've got a lot to talk about as we'll recap episodes that have already taken place. 30 sessions. We've got a lot to catch up on. If you haven't listened to all the episodes, go back and check them out in the archives. If you have listened to every episode, go listen again. More than likely, you're going to pick up on a couple points that you may have missed the first time around. So, Take this time to share an episode, let your friends know about the Breaking Brews podcast. The archives will be alive and strong, and we'll be back in a couple months with the season premiere of season two of the Breaking Brews podcast. Once again, thank you very, very much for making season one a success, and I look forward to being back with you guys for season two and beyond. I'm your host, Jason Sircone. This is the Breaking Brews podcast, and as always, this has been... The word of the port. <laughs>